Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Women's Health Podcast, A Woman's Journey, Insights That Matter. I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, and I invite you to listen to Johns Hopkins specialists discuss the latest topics in women's health. Now here's your host, Lily Shockney. Hi, this is Lily Shockney from A Woman's Journey at Johns Hopkins, and this is our podcast, Insights That Matter. Today we are joined by cardiologist Hugh Culkins, a professor of medicine and director of the Cardiac Arrhythmia Services here at Johns Hopkins. September is AFib Awareness Month. Knowing about AFib, and he's going to give us a, a tutorial on learning about it today, it's important because it is the most common sustained cardiac arrhythmia currently affecting 5.1 million Americans and the prevalence is expected to increase to 12.1 million by 2050. And though 2050 sounds like it's a long distance away, it frankly really isn't. AFib also increases stroke risk fivefold. So this is a a serious disorder and something that we need to be educated about. So I wanna thank the audience for joining us today. So Dr. Calkins, what exactly is atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation is a chaotic, irregular heart rhythm abnormality that affects the upper chambers of the heart. And if you think about a normal heartbeat at 60 or 70 beats a minute, when a patient has atrial fibrillation, the upper chamber is going three to 400 beats per minute. It's quivering. I think of it like a bag of snakes. It's just sort of quivering back and forth, and it's beating so rapidly, it can't effectively push blood through the heart, so it impacts the heart function and and the timing of cardiac contraction. How long would this quivering be taking place? One minute, five minutes to actually be an official diagnosis of AFib? Well, to officially be crowned as having atrial fibrillation, you need 30 seconds or more of atrial fibrillation documented on some EKG or some type of monitor So it's 30 seconds or more. And then once you get diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, there are different types of atrial fibrillation. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is atrial fibrillation that starts and stops on its own with none of the episodes lasting more than seven days. Once you have atrial fibrillation that lasts more than seven days continuously, then we refer to it as persistent atrial fibrillation. And when you've had an AFib episode that's lasted more than 12 months continuously, then we call it long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. And obviously, the early forms of AFib are the intermittent forms. Over time, it becomes persistent and long-standing persistent. And with each more advanced stage, it's harder to treat. I would imagine that there would be some really specific symptoms that someone should be watchful of or watchful of their family members having that may signal that their heart is beating out of control. So what types of symptoms would be presented? Well, atrial fibrillation can present with a very wide range of symptoms. Probably the most dramatic symptom would be passing out or severe lightheadedness with your heart rate beating chaotically. So that would be a fairly extreme symptom, one where you'd call 911 and go to the emergency room. The most common symptom is actually fatigue or decrease exercise tolerance when you go on your morning walk, you're more short of breath or it takes longer or something like that. And then fatigue, just feeling more tired is probably one of the most common symptoms of atrial fibrillation. So it can present in many different ways. Everyone knows about heart attacks and chest pain, but we really like to encourage patients to think about their heart rhythm, their pulse. And with atrial fibrillation, the way to recognize it is you have an irregularly irregular pulse that may be fast or may be a normal speed, but it's chaotically irregular. So instead of beat, 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 you get beat, 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 beat. beat. There's no real pattern to it. Mm -hmm. So that's really, you know, if you check your pulse or listen to your heart or you have one of those pulse ox monitors or you have a a Fitbit or whatever, you'll see this very chaotically irregular heart rhythm. Is it possible to not have any symptoms at all and have this condition? Oh, absolutely. Atrial fibrillation, not uncommonly, is asymptomatic. 
And as we'll talk about later, AFib is more common as you get older. So we all know that for cancer screening, you're supposed to get a colonoscopy at whatever age, 50 or something like that. And it's not uncommon for someone to come in for their colonoscopy and feeling fine, and they're, lo and behold, they're in atrial fibrillation. Or people go and see their doctor for their annual checkup feeling fine, and lo and behold, the doctor senses an irregular pulse, gets an EKG, and you have atrial fibrillation. So welcome to being over 50. Yeah. What are some of the risk factors for developing AFib? Well, there's many risk factors for developing atrial fibrillation. So the most important or powerful in my mind is age. So I always tell patients AFib is rare before 50, and by the time you're 80, one in 10 people have it. It's one of these things, you hit 50, and then it starts to show up. So age is probably the most powerful Mm -hmm. risk factor. Other risk factors have to do with body size. The bigger you are, the more likely you are to develop atrial fibrillation. And that refers both to height, but also body weight. So if you're very tall and very overweight, you're most likely to get AFib. And if you're a skinny, short person, you're least likely to get atrial fibrillation. And it's interesting, when you think about this, mice never get atrial fibrillation. And whales, I've been told, are almost always in atrial fibrillation all the time. Oh, my goodness. So people are sort of arranged between mice and whales, (laughs) somewhere in between. So that's important. Other risk factors are hypertension, a family history of AFib at an early onset. So we don't think of AFib generally as inherited, but if you have members of your family that get AFib before 50, that's quite unusual. So in you, you probably have some family genetic abnormality that sort of predisposes it. Another important risk factor is sleep apnea. Turns out of people with sleep apnea, about half have AFib, and of people with AFib, about half have sleep apnea. So that's another risk factor. So hypertension, age, size, sleep apnea, family history, all these things play a role. And more often found in men than in women? Yes, more common in men than women. Is there any Oh, and one other thing. It's more common in elite athletes. So you'd think the guy who's out there running marathons and triathlons and all this is, is uniquely healthy. Well, those individuals have far more AFib than you'd expect someone who's slender to have. And, and that's because when you're a big athlete, you know, you're really pushing your heart. Your heart dilates, your atria dilate, you get more scar in your heart. So AFib is actually much more common in, in high-level endurance athletes. Oh, my goodness. I would not have realized that. Talk a little bit about hyper and hypothyroidism. Another disease that's linked to AFib is hypo or hyperthyroidism. And when anyone's newly diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, you'll always order thyroid function tests. I mean, it's quite uncommon for AFib to be the only manifestation of either hyper or hypothyroidism, but we see it, and it's part of the standard evaluation, so I'm sure if anyone on this broadcast has AFib, that their doctor ordered thyroid function tests when it was first diagnosed. Yes, I would hope so. AFib is important because it also is associated with increased risk of stroke. Can you talk a bit about that? Certainly, the older we get, the more I know we have to worry about stroke yeah. risk as well. The number one thing for everyone to know about atrial fibrillation is that it increases your risk of stroke fivefold, and that the strokes that come from AFib are large, and they're either deadly, they kill you, or they render you disabled. Mm. So it's extremely important. And if someone has AFib, their stroke risk is up. But we can fine-tune the estimate based on other stroke risk factors. And the other stroke risk factors to be aware of are age over 65 and particularly over 75. So the older you get once you hit 65, the risk starts going up of stroke associated with AFib. Hypertension, heart failure, prior stroke, vascular disease, prior heart attack, prior stroke, all those are risk factors. So when you get diagnosed with AFib, there's something called the chads VASC risk score. And in general, if your score is two or greater, you should be anticoagulated. If it's zero, you don't have to. If it's one, it's in between. And the chads VASC factors are C is for congestive heart failure, H is for hypertension, and that's even treated or controlled hypertension. It means you've been diagnosed with hypertension. Hmm. Age is for age over 65. Once you hit 75, you get two points. D is for diabetes. Stroke is for prior stroke or TIA. 
part of the score used to be female gender, but that's been thrown out of the latest guidelines because the latest data says that women are not at dramatically increased risk. Maybe it's a tiny little risk factor, but it's not. It's no longer part of the anticoagulation score, so that's important to know. Got it. Association with dementia, which is certainly a concern for everyone as they're getting older. So we think about stroke. You know, the first thing is preserve the brain and prevent strokes. And then the other problem with AFib is AFib increases the risk of dementia. If you look at 10,000 people with AFib and 10,000 people without AFib, and you correct for all other differences between the two groups, those with AFib have more dementia, senile dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, all types of dementia. So that's one thing. Heart failure. Heart failure is more common in patients with atrial fibrillation. Sudden death is more common in patients with atrial fibrillation. So there's many reasons why you would prefer not to have atrial fibrillation. Now, what is missing is as of now, we don't have studies saying that if I get rid of your AFib, I'll prevent you from getting dementia, or I'll prevent you from getting heart failure, or I'll prevent you from ever dying. Someday, hopefully, we'll have studies that prove those points. But yes, AFib is the link to a lot of bad outcomes, so it's, it's something everyone should be aware of. Certainly should be, oh my heavens. And dementia, and just saying that word, creates fear in, in everyone. Well, um, one of the interesting <clears throat> questions is why is AFib linked to dementia? There's been several reasons why you can sort of explain this link. One is from small, silent strokes. So if you have AFib, you have more strokes, and there's data saying that if you have AFib, and you're appropriately anticoagulated, the risk of dementia is less than if you're not anticoagulated. So that's one reason. The second is they've done studies showing that when you're in AFib, blood flow to certain regions of your brain decreases. So just that irregular heartbeat makes your blood flow less effective, and so you decrease blood flow to certain parts of your brain. So that's another one of the potential links between dementia and atrial fibrillation. But I agree with you. It's spooky. I mean, we all fear death, but I think we fear dementia. Far worse. Almost far worse, almost yes. as much as stroke. Yep. And this obviously impacts quality of life in a significant way for patients that are dealing with AFib because they, yes. they are tired. They're probably hesitant about going out and doing activities. And it can be a catch-22 because it could end up being a couch potato, which we don't want either. Yeah. No, there's been loads of studies showing that AFib reduces quality of life. And at the end of the day, when we think about treating AFib with medications or procedures, our main goal is to improve quality of life. That's been proven. If you have someone who has a lousy quality of life and they have AFib, you get them back to normal rhythm, guess what? They're going to feel better. Mm -hmm. So unlike some of the things about heart failure and dementia, you know, it's proven that, that by getting rid of AFib, we can improve quality of life. And at the end of the day, I think quality of life matters to all of us a lot. It certainly does. What are some of the ways that the rhythm can be controlled, that we can have it not just be quivering? When you think about AFib management, you know, the first is what's your risk of stroke? Do you need to be on a blood thinner? And that's sort of number one. And once that's been addressed, the next question is, are we going to pursue what's called a rhythm control strategy or a rate control strategy? A rhythm control strategy means we're going to work with you, the patient, to get you back to normal rhythm and keep you there. A rate control strategy means we're going to ignore the AFib, but we're going to give you medicines to slow down your heart rate so you don't exceed the speed limit. And basically, if you decide you have no symptoms from AFib, we're going to leave you on AFib forever, we're going to call the AFib permanent, we want your heart rate, your ventricular rate, your pulse, to be 80 or less at rest. That's generally considered sort of the recommended rate control. If your heart rate's going 120, 130, 140 beats a minute all the time, three to four weeks later, you go in congestive heart failure. It's a major problem. So the first question is, are we going to try to control the AFib or are we just trying to slow it down? If we try to control the AFib, our options are antiarrhythmic medications, or something called catheter ablation. And another procedure you may hear about is cardioversion. Cardioversion is what you see on the movies when someone gets, you know, stand back and you get the defibrillator and you shock them. In order to get someone who's stuck in AFib continuously back to normal rhythm, you're going to have to give them a little jolt 
a cardio version to restore normal rhythm. And then the question becomes, well, how do you keep that person in normal rhythm? And that's where the medicines or the procedures come in. It's like hitting the reset button. Exactly. Risk factor modification. What can individuals do that can reduce their risk of one day or maybe soon ending up with AFib? One of the components of treating AFib, we've talked about anticoagulation, we've talked about rhythm control or rate control. It's now recognized that risk factor modification is critical. And by that, it mainly means get your weight down to what it should be, a BMI of 27 or less. If you have sleep apnea, get treated for that. And then looking at other aspects of your life, like alcohol. There's been a recent study just reported at the American Heart Meetings where they looked at patients who had on average three drinks an evening, and they randomized the patients to two groups. They said half the patients stop drinking and the other half keep drinking. And they saw that the teetotalers, the folks where you cut out the alcohol, ended up having less AFib than the ones that kept drinking. So alcohol, certainly in significant levels, can play a role. But I think most of the focus these days is on weight. And there's been a number of remarkable studies coming out of Australia saying that if you have AFib and you're overweight, just by weight loss alone, you can eliminate AFib or decrease the amount of AFib in many patients, 50% or more. And if you get treated for your AFib with catheter ablation or medications, it's going to be 30% more effective if you lose the weight than if you don't. Weight loss is really critical. Now, it's not easy, and that's a real challenge, but the science is there saying this is really important. Similarly, if you're someone that's that's thinking about you're closing in on 50 and you don't want AFib, <laughs> well, one way to try to prevent getting AFib is to get that weight down to sort of an optimal you know body weight that that will do you lots of good. I know that you know right after the holidays, at the end of the calendar year, there's always all these commercials on television for various diets and food that can be shipped to you, or here's a discount for the gym and such, but those are usually short-lived. That That's the New Year's resolution is to lose weight, and they may go to the gym or may eat differently for one or two months, and then it's back to those old behaviors. So, you know, small changes, small, steady changes rather than trying to kind of jump off the cliff to get your weight down seems but, to work better. You know, it's interesting, though. There's data, like with gastric bypass, if you can't get the weight off just by dieting, there's now been studies showing that if you get a gastric bite, you know, no matter how you get the weight off, that's going to help your AFib a lot. I should say one other thing about AFib management, and that is we talked about being in AFib continuously. And the longer you're in AFib, the harder it is to get you out. And the tipping point is usually two to three years. That patient that goes in to see their doctor and they're found to be an AFib, and the patient's feeling fine, you may say, well, fine, let's just leave them an AFib the rest of their life. The problem is, if you do nothing for that patient, when they come back in three years, maybe they'll have heart failure or dementia, who knows what, but by then you say, okay, I want to control the AFib, it's too late. Mm. So there's been a shift towards treating AFib earlier, and even if someone says they're asymptomatic, I mean, if they're 95 and asymptomatic, well, fine, God bless them. Mm-hmm. But if you're 50 and asymptomatic, if it was me, I would want to get back to normal rhythm, get the cardioversion done, then reassess how I feel. And many patients just think this is old age, but they don't realize how good they'll feel if they're really in normal rhythm. There are so many people that don't go for an annual physical. They only go if they've got something wrong which is really unfortunate because we want to do more prevention than we do trying to get in front of the train after the train's left yeah. the station. The thing that's really spooky about it, I saw a patient in clinic last week, you know, a young guy in his 60s, but he you know, has a stroke out of the blue. And lo and behold, of course, he has AFib, asymptomatic AFib, presenting it as, as a stroke. That's one of the more dramatic presentations. Mm. And we now know that if a patient has a stroke and it's unexplained, you know, the neurologist can't explain it, we always will screen for atrial fibrillation with a prolonged monitor. And in about 30% of those patients, you'll find AFib, and that will impact their treatment because instead of being on aspirin, which neurologists often use for stroke prevention, if it's a stroke due to AFib, you need to be on an anticoagulant. 
not aspirin and anticoagulant, and there's right. a number one of these numbers, you know, these new anticoagulant medicines. It's a very interesting topic. Some people don't know if they have sleep apnea. It could be because they live alone or they just don't know what the symptoms would be. Can you talk about that a little bit, that gasp for air? Yeah, um, well, I mean, the classic thing is you see a patient in clinic and you ask, do you have sleep apnea? And they look at you with a blank face and then you turn to the wife or husband and say, or you turn to the patient and say, do you snore? And their partner will oftentimes pipe up, oh, yes, I moved out you know, a year ago. I couldn't possibly do this terrible. Endure that, yes. So that's one tip-off. Someone who snores heavily, particularly if they intermittently stop breathing, that would be very, very classic. But I would say that for other patients, there may be no report of snoring. And we're at the point now where certainly if someone has AFib and they have a they look like someone that would have a sleep apnea. They have a thick neck, they're overweight, or they're very tall and skinny, like a giraffe. That's a group where you're really suspicious, but we're moving to the point where we say, anyone with newly diagnosed AFib, we should do a sleep study, because even people that you wouldn't expect it may have it. And the good thing is, in the old days, when you know, to diagnose it, you'd have to go have a sleep study and sleep in some sleep lab, and no one obviously likes that. Now they have home sleep tests where they send something to your home and you can do it in the privacy of your home home, and, and you can screen for it without having to go somewhere and sleep in a foreign place and to be hooked up with all kinds of gadgets. Yes, and probably also miss a day from work, which people try to avoid as well. Exactly. Yeah. You just talked to us about alcohol. I'm curious to know, does it matter what kind of alcohol Oftentimes people think, well, if drinking wine is good for my heart, but maybe beer is bad or a mixed cocktail. Does the research no. study make any differentiation as to what kind of alcohol? No, there's no differentiation. I mean, in my own mind, there's another condition called holiday heart. Holiday heart's what you see New Year's Day after everyone's been out partying New Year's <laughs> Eve. If you get wildly intoxicated, uh. many people will go into AFib from holiday heart. When you think about having a one to two glass of wine a day or two times a week or whatever, I don't think it's the alcohol so much that does it. I think it's the calories that come in the Trojan horse of alcohol. Ah. You know, every glass of wine, whatever, 100, 200 calories or whatever it is. I think that's the reason the real link mm. is. I mean, if someone's working to lose weight and they can cut down from four drinks a day to two drinks a day, before you know it, it's They're a pound, pound less per week right off yes. the top. Absolutely. Tobacco. Yeah, certainly smoking is terrible. And anyone who's listening who smokes, I would definitely encourage you to stop. I just got back from a meeting in Lisbon. It's amazing in Europe, the cigarette packages, they put these horrifying pictures on the cigarette packages of people with lung cancer, or people ah. with all kinds of terrible cancers Scare to techniques. scare them away. Uh -huh. from. But in the U.S., I haven't seen any of those terrible pictures on cigarettes, but I haven't looked too closely. No, but, I've seen a couple so, commercials recently. Yeah, but, but certainly smoking cigarettes. is really bad. But I think it's also been linked somewhat with atrial fibrillation. I don't think it's one of the strongest risk factors, but it certainly there's a hundred reasons not to smoke. And now we're also dealing with different methods of, I'm still going to call it smoking, e-cigarettes and vaping that are still carrying nicotine into the body. And I, I think that People are under the impression, well, this is 100% safe. I don't have to worry about that. You know, it was developed to help people wean off of cigarettes, but that's not necessarily how it's being used. And I was watching a show the other night. An individual from the CDC said that in calendar year 2018, there was an uptake by 78% of teenagers uh, vaping. And that no, I have yet me. to see any studies on vaping and AFib. I'm sure they'll be coming, but your question reminded me of two other risk factors for AFib. One is poor sleep quality. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't have sleep apnea, if you toss and turn and have poor sleep quality, that's a risk for AFib. Another is stress. So there's been studies showing mm -hmm. that yoga and things to reduce your stress are helpful for controlling your AFib. So that it just piqued my 
my member to mention I that. I was going to ask you about stress, and it's difficult to have people get out of the fast lane, isn't it? Everybody's yeah. in the fast lane, it, it seems. And with so much technology bringing what seems to always be bad news right to you, it's hard to find the good news. They just you know slam in front of you the bad news. It just raises people's anxiety and concerns. I'll be curious to see over time whether or not we begin to see a higher incidence of women developing this, perhaps matching the incidence for men as we've seen for heart attack. Whereas if I go back two generations ago for for my family, my both of my grandmothers were housewives, and I think their main concern was, am I going to get dinner cooked on time? before my husband gets home. And other things, she didn't fret about, do we have money for the bills? My grandfathers were gonna take care of that. And they were the ones at higher risk for heart problems. But now in most cases, it's men and women out in the workforce and whether it be a stressful job or a stressful drive to work or worrying about your kids and are they vaping and whatever else. (laughs) that we do need to really take seriously teaching people how to reduce their anxiety and stress. And I don't think that people value such things as three minutes of meditation. They just think, oh, that's, what would that do? Well, it could do you some really good. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I agree. (laughs) Really good. I think we need to take care of ourselves much better and factor in that time out a couple times a day and say, let me just exhale for a few minutes yeah. uh, here, right? I agree. What are you seeing in the area of research that would be for the future as to perhaps how, are we developing other ways to also diagnose this as well as also treat it? Well, in terms of diagnosis, you know, a lot's happening with these wearables. So we all know that the Apple Watch now has a module that can you know screen for atrial fibrillation. It was just released. So this is sort of the latest gadget you can get. So for people that are really concerned about this or it runs in your family or whatever, the latest Apple Watch can give you nice EKG tracings, and it also has algorithms based on pulse oximetry that can uh, detect atrial fibrillation. I know that Fitbit, all the wearables are going to have AFib detection abilities. So, so yes, there's lots of new research and interest in these new approaches to diagnose AFib. I mean, one of the reasons for AFib Awareness Month is to increase awareness of this condition. Right. It's so common, and yet so many people, they know about heart attack, they know about cancer, but they don't know about atrial fibrillation. And guess what? Atrial fibrillation could give you a big stroke and could kill you. Uh-huh. And so you should make it your business to know about it. Yes, there's new research on diagnosis. There's research on you know, how do we prevent AFib from a population health standpoint? That just comes down to, the, I think, largely on sort of weight and those types of issues. And then there's lots of research on better treatment strategies for atrial fibrillation. I mean, right now we have medications that work in 30 to 50% of patients. We have catheter ablation. We can cauterize the AFib. That works in, you know, we'll call it 60 to 80% of patients. But our goal is obviously, you know, 100% cure, being able to cure AFib and all patients, but we aren't there yet. But we have wonderful technology and tools now, but there's more being developed all the time. So I'm, I'm very optimistic that certainly in, in my lifetime, we're going to be eliminating AFib with very high success. One of the other things that we think about is the notion that, that it's easiest to treat AFib when it's early on in its disease course. When you first develop intermittent AFib, if you, you know, have a catheter ablation procedure, the success rate may be as high as 80%. Whereas if you wait until you've been stuck in AFib for three years continuously, success rate's about 20%. So it's much better to move upstream and treat the AFib early yeah. and prevent it from ever becoming continuous because the folks with a continuous AFib, you got to do five procedures to treat one patient. Wow. Whereas the earlier patients, you can treat four patients with five, you know, five get treated, four do well. Mm-hmm. Four do well. Mm-hmm. Wow. Thank you so much for joining us today. You are a wealth of information. I think that as we do move forward, the individuals that are listening to this podcast today are going to pay more attention to their own heartbeat, as well as to those that are in their family and living under their roof. 
as yeah, there's well. One, there's one last thing that I just want to make sure that everyone listening is aware of, and that is we talked about stroke risk from AFib, but it's important to know that we have new anticoagulant medications that will decrease the stroke risk by about 90%. And these are, are medications that aren't like warfarin, Coumadin, the old medicine you had to check the levels and you couldn't eat spinach or whatever. These are more effective than warfarin and you don't have any monitoring. You just take one or two pills a day and you've dropped the risk 90%. So the most feared part of AFib, the stroke piece, we really have control. You recognize AFib, you're at high stroke risk, your Chad's Vask is too. You go on an anticoagulant. That's the next step. And I think that's very reassuring. I think it should be reassuring to everyone mm-hmm. that we really can eliminate, nearly eliminate the stroke risk from AFib with some of the new medications that have been developed. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's been wonderful chatting with you. Thank you for listening to A Woman's Journey podcast. Join me, Kelly Gear Ripkin, your host, Lily Shockney, and a variety of Johns Hopkins experts on the first Thursday of each month to learn about medical advances in women's health. A Woman's Journey is grateful for the unrestricted educational grants from Biosense Webster and Boston Scientific that support our podcast series, Insights That Matter. For more information about A Woman's Journey, visit our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey and like us on Facebook and Twitter. Until next time, stay well.